Brown, don't get caught in the mind fit The fuel to the fire, ain't nobody can stop it It's a trouble in my city, but you know I'm across it Got a 40 on my hip and I'm liable to spark it Throw down these hits, my click is indivisible I aim, you duck, I squeeze, now you invisible I'm not afraid of getting physical All these different chemicals are fogging up my visual Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Yo, we notorious, we ain't no runners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Yo, we some warriors, they ain't caught gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Put on my sweat, put on my beat, put on the map, put on my team Take out every motherfucker in between, know what I mean? Better myself, better my aim, better my rep, better my name Killing rappers on my hang, I'm about to chase for the fame Never thought I would and now I'm running You don't wanna follow me, no one's gonna be fun What's going on? What's going on? Good evening and welcome to another broadcast of Steve the Kidney Nurse I am your host, Steve Belcher Man, it's been almost... Maybe six days, seven days since I've uh, been on and did an education. Look, man, this whole week, man, you know how people have different situations that come up in your life? This was one of these weeks for me as far as working 12 to 14 hours, having car issues, um, all kind of stuff going on. But I just thank God that I'm able to be here today. I'm so grateful to be here today to able to do another broadcast. And this broadcast today is impacts a lot of kidney warriors. Because we have a lot of kidney warriors that have this right here in their chest or in their leg, because you could put it in your leg as a femoral catheter. But the average patient that has this device, it's in there right here, either the left or the right side. And so how does this happen? How does one person go from not knowing, give you a scenario, not knowing that they had kidney disease, because nine out of 10 people have stage three kidney disease and don't even know it. So you have stage three, you don't even know it. And so you continue to do the things that may have got you to stage three. So the next thing you know, a year, two years later, you find kidney disease knocking on your door. But this time it's kidney failure. The distant cousin of kidney disease. Or the first cousin, I say. You find yourself going to the emergency room because you're having these symptoms. Nausea. Vomiting. Feeling weak. Ankle swollen. Shortness of breath. Not able to breathe. You're like, what's going on with me? Like, what the hell is going on with me? You get to the emergency room. They put on the blood pressure cup, squeezing it up. Or pushing the machine so it can automatically inflate. Next thing you know, you look over at the screen. And you see something like 200 over 110. You're like, what? 
Hey, we got to get you back. They start drawing blood. And you sitting in the room like worrying. They got you hooked up to the blood pressure machine, the monitors. It's going off. Boop, boop, boop. And, you know, you ain't never been in a situation before. You're like, God damn, what's going on? You Maybe on your cell phone talking to your people or on TikTok Live or whatever, broadcasting that you're in a hospital and you don't know what's going on. And then doctor comes back in and say, hey, your kidneys have failed. You're going to need hemodialysis. You're like, hemodialysis? What's that? And then explain to you where artificial uh, kidney, but they'll be in a hospital showing you this, right? Hey, an artificial kidney. You trying to get it in your mind what an artificial kidney look like. And you don't see this. It doesn't hit you until a nurse like myself bring the machine in the room. You're like, what is that? Stuff hooked up. So now to the point where hemodialysis and where this comes into play, the catheter. This is where we start off now. Because you already went through the ER, you found out you had kidney disease that turned into kidney failure. Now you're in the hospital in the emergency room. They're about to admit you. And the doctor comes and says, you're going to need hemodialysis, your kidney failure. You're like, what's hemodialysis? So here's where we start this show. Hemodialysis is a treatment used when these fail, which is stage five kidney disease. It could be at 5%. It could be at 4 You got some people who don't even be on dialysis at 5%. It just depends on your body. But medically speaking, on the average, your kidneys are failing at stage five, that's why I call it end stage renal disease. And can no longer clean your blood and remove extra fluid from your body. They can't do that no more. So if your body or your kidneys can't remove extra fluid, and clean your blood from waste, now what? Now what do you do? You you wonder, you, you're lying in the bed, okay, my kidneys don't work. So now they can't remove the fluid and clean the blood. So so what now, Doc? How, how do we address that issue? He said, I'm glad you asked. Because we have to put a hemodialysis access or vascular access somewhere in you to get to your blood so we can do this hemodialysis treatment. So right now, people who are already on dialysis, if you receive hemodialysis, your access is one of the following. An AV fistula made by joining an artery and vein in your arm. You either have that, an AV graft, which is made by using a soft tube to join an artery and vein in your arm. That's the second access. And the third one, which we're going to talk about tonight, is a catheter. Okay? A soft tube that is placed in a large vein. So I'm pointing to my YouTube people in the picture. Placed in a large vein, usually in your neck. Okay, and this is what we're talking about. This catheter. Now. Supposedly, according to 
kidney organizations. That's all I want to say. I'm not going to call no names. But according to professional kidney organizations, and you can imagine or put to the imagination who I'm talking about, recommend the AV fistula as the preferred choice for permanent vascular access. They say the AV fistula is the preferred choice. Which it is because it's using your natural veins. Then they say the AV graft is the next preferred choice for permanent access, which is the man made tube that goes under your arm, which is the graft. Then they say the catheter is the last resort and should only be used as a perm i mean as a temporary access even like steve no way because how is that all my veins are not working and i have to have a catheter and that may be true you have a lot of in between but this is the average consensus of this organization for the average person who don't have those issues Now, what is a hemodialysis catheter? I've been showing you it. You've been seeing your warrior friends with them. You're like, what's that? Like, what's that device? It got two limbs on it. It clamps up. It got these caps on it. What is it? Well, a dialysis catheter is used, well, let me back up. The catheter used for hemodialysis is referred to as a tunneled catheter. Tunneled because it is placed under the skin. Now, there are two types. Two types of tunnel catheters cuffed or non-cuffed okay two types of tunnel catheters cuff or non-cuff non-cuff tunnel catheters are used for emergencies and for short periods up to three weeks as some of you may have seen the ij catheter that i was showing it's shorter about about this short and it could go right here, side of your neck, called the IJ catheter. Or they could put it right here in the subclavian vein. Now, tunnel cuff catheters, a type recommended by major organization for temporary access, can be used for longer than three weeks. Okay. Now, they say an AV fistula or graft has been placed, but is not yet ready. Okay, let me go back. They say when you use a tunnel cuff catheter, a type recommended by these organizations for temporary use, it can be used for longer. This is what they say. It can be used for longer periods than three weeks when an AV fistula or graft has been placed but not yet ready for use. You warriors know what I'm talking about. You go get the, finally decided to go get the surgery and they put it in and you still got this in. And so they're still using this before they stick you. And then, you know, say when they decided to stick you, it don't look like your access has developed. And here they come in with the needle trying to trying to put it in and, and it's not working you like oh my god shit i hope you stop they trying to get it they got the got the tourniquet wrapped around your arm 
like 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 you're about to give yourself a hype or something. You know, <laughs> yeah, I say everything on here, but no, you got the tourniquet on your arm, right? You got the tourniquet on, and they they poking you in your arm, and nothing's coming. Now you should say, stop, stop. Let's just use the catheter. Good idea. So now your arm is a little bit more swollen. They switch to the catheter. And you knew in yourself that it wasn't ready to use. But they were so determined to hurry up to get this poured out. So also you can have a tunnel cuff catheter longer than three weeks. Now check this one out. When there are no other options, okay? When there are no other options for permanent access. For example, when a patient's blood vessels are not strong enough for a fistula or graft. So you hear that? So don't let them tell you, and the surgeon told you you got small veins. You don't, you don't want to be that, that guinea pig. You want to do your research. Again, it says, let me reread this so you can fully understand what I'm saying if you have a catheter and you don't want to get it removed, at least not yet. The catheter is used for hemodial the catheter used for hemodialysis is a tunnel catheter because it is placed under the skin. There are two types of tunnel catheters. Cuff or non-cuff. Non-cuff tunnel catheters are used for emergencies and for short periods up to 3 weeks. Tunnel cuff, again, tunnel cuff, not non-cuff, but tunnel cuff catheters, a type recommended by certain organizations for temporary access, can be used for longer than three weeks when an AV fistula or graft has been placed but is not yet ready for use. Two, there are no other options. No other options. Those options are exhausted for permanent access. That means there's no other place they can find. They, you see patients got access here, 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 here. And, and maybe both of their legs. I've seen it. I've seen it. You're like, Steve, are you serious? Yes. Access here, 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 here. That's four. Two in each arm. And then one in each leg. And then they got to have a femoral catheter. One of these in the growing in the femoral artery. Because there's nowhere else to go. But how did it get to that point where you have four accesses where something else could have possibly been done before it got to that point? So, for example, when a patient's blood vessels are not strong enough for a fistula or graft, you're going to have to have this for longer than three weeks. Like we had one TikTok person that mentioned. They had this for, they got this going on six years. So what does that tell you? That it debunks the people who come to you at the clinic 
and try to pressure you to get it yanked out. Now, I'm not encouraging you to keep this in. No, I'm not. But what I am saying, and I would say this for myself, if I was on dialysis, if I got diagnosed, and I got stage two, but if I was diagnosed with kidney failure, and if, if I decided, because I have my opinions about going on dialysis, I may decide to do no treatment. That's me, conservative therapy, which is no treatment at all. But if I did decide to go on dialysis, I would try PD first. And if I didn't like that, yeah, I would do home dialysis, but I want to have the catheter. I want to have the catheter until the day I die. It ain't going to be no transplants. There ain't going to be none of that for me. That's just me. I, you know what I'm saying? And it's not because of this or that, but that's my personal decision. So let's move on. Um, now, now check this out. Catheters have two openings inside. And, and this is what I show people all the time. These are two limbs. You got the red, which is the arterial. And then you got the blue, which is the venous. So the arterial, which is the red, opening to draw blood from your vein and out of your body into the dialysis lines. So when we hook up the lines, we got the arterial line that hooks up to the arterial limb or arterial port. And then we got the venous line that connects to the venous port. And what happens, the blood comes out and it goes through the machine, gets clean, and come back through the venous port. So the venous allows clean blood to come back into the body. It's just a continuous cycle. Instead of using your arm, you're using the catheter. And a lot of warriors like this because they, you know, you don't really have to do anything. You don't, you know, you don't have to get stuck in your arm at this point. You don't have to hold your sights. You know, it has its disadvantages and advantages, just like the graft or the AV fistula. All of them have advantages and disadvantages. So let's shift. How do you take care of your catheter? You may be having some warriors watching, just got this. And they may not want, you may not want to have the staff at the unit cleaning it. They may not be cleaning it right. They may not be washing their hands. You, and you see this by observing them when you're sitting down doing your treatment. And you're just looking around, observing, and you're just noticing some things. You may know, I don't want these people touching me, changing that. I change it myself. But how do you take care of your catheter if you have one right now? You may not have been told what I'm about to say. You may not even know. Who knows? But let's find out. By taking good care of your access, it will last longer and you will prevent problems, which one big problem is an infection and clotting. Now, you can't prevent the clotting of these holes which goes into the blood vessel. You can't prevent blood from clogging up these holes, these little small holes at the bottom of the tip, 
because it's inside the vein. But how they do that when it start working because of that, they put a medicine in there called um, Activase. And I thought I had the box up here. It's called Activase or Calf Flow. And so if they ain't got that, the dialysis clinic, they ain't had, if they don't have that medicine, because that medicine is expensive, and I don't think they get reimbursed. But if they don't got that and nothing's coming out, plan on going to the access center where they're going to exchange the catheter. They're not going to strip like they used to in the old days. No, they want to get paid. So they're going to take it out and put a new one in. That's, that's what they do now. So here are some important steps that you can take if you got a catheter. Keep the catheter dressing clean and dry. Okay? Clean and dry. All right, I want to read some of these comments in a moment. So don't go anywhere, TikTok. I mean, I'm sorry, YouTube and Facebook. I see your comments. And we're going to address it. Thanks for commenting and thanks for watching. So one, keep the dressing that's on your catheter clean and dry. Because some of these units, like the Vita, they just put on, like, I don't know if they still do this or not, but I, I heard reports that they still got to use a gauze and tape. Gauze and tape. Where some places they use a dressing. Okay, like now again, if you was a patient, would you want gauze and tape? What they do is put the tape around the edges, or would you want a professional gauze uh, dressing? You be the judge. And then the one thing about this, if it's hot in the summer and you live down in the um, uh, southern belt states where it gets extremely humid, so humid when you walk outside, you automatically start perspiring. I mean, just automatically. I... I, I Experienced that down in Houston. Go visit my daughter. I'm talking about hot that I don't want to leave the hotel room. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna address that, Keisha. Okay. So make sure if if you your clinic doesn't have these and they use this. Like the tape and gauze. You can order these from Amazon. And learn how to clean the dressing yourself by Googling how do you change a hemodialysis catheter dressing. And I'm sure you'll find something. All right, I want to take a quick um, pause uh, of how to take care of my catheter. The first one was keep the Catholic clean and dry. Well, pause for the cause, but we had a question, um, and I want to address this from Keisha Champion from Facebook, and this can probably help some other warriors who could be going through this situation as Keisha on Facebook. So Keisha says, they started using my graft in the hospital the second week. And my arm was in so much pain, I was begging them to cut my arm off. Then Keisha goes on to say, I did PD for nine years before going clinical for two years. Then Keisha got transplanted. She got transplanted. 
That's awesome, Keisha. Then Keisha comes back and say, why can't a graph be removed when no longer being used? All I was told is it cannot be removed. All right, Keisha. So what I could possibly, one of the things, I don't know this for sure. Don't take this for a hundred percent what I'm about to say. But what I'm about to say makes logical sense. Okay. Now, the graph is a two. Now, depending on if you're like a diabetic, all right, to take out that graph, you would be at serious risk for an infection. The only time they remove those graphs is when they become infected. Now, if you got diabetes and you got a graph, the reason why you don't take a graph is because it may take time to heal. And if it don't heal all the way, you could possibly get gangrene. So it's unfortunate that you have thousands and I mean thousands of kidney warriors walking around with multiple grafts, fistulas in their arm, either after transplant. Now, you can get the fistula tied off, but a lot of times, if you got a fistula, they don't want it, and you get a transplant, they don't want you to get that tied off because what if your 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 kidney fell? Like I know a young lady had transplant for fifteen years, and she had to go back on dialysis. Access still working after fifteen years. So at least you didn't have to go and get another surgery. But it's just unfortunate. So let's move on. Wait a minute. I think she may have. Oh, okay. Okay. Keisha says she's no longer a diabetic. She had a pancreas transplant when she had the kidney transplant. And for a lot of words, you're watching this and you're on the transplant list. Let's just say this. If you do need a pancreas, it's recommended. I'm not saying do this, but for a lot of veterans who have had pancreas, a double transplant pancreas kidney, it's recommended, not by me, but just in the community, that you do both at the same time. Don't get like the kidney transplant and the pancreas at a different time or the pancreas and the kidney at a different time because what they say is that the list is kind of short if you need a pancreas kidney. And so that kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say fast track, but getting the pancreas and kidney at the same time that kind of happens more often. Guess I could say that. Okay. So, yes, yes. So don't lose hope, please. Especially if you're on the list. Your time is coming. Okay, so let's move on. Also, how to keep your catheter clean. The second one is make sure the area of the insertion site, so right here would be this area. Oh, so right here, it would be like if it was coming out my neck, it would be right here. So it's like make sure the area of the insertion site is clean and the people at the clinic changes the dressing at each dialysis session. So that's why they clean it at each session because they're supposed to. It's the policy. But who wants gauze and tape? 
this is how it would look. And now imagine tape around the edges opposed to having the dressing. You see the difference? That's the difference. Also, it says, which this is for the graph to Fisher, but it says, Keep an emergency dressing kit at home in case you need to change your dressing in between treatments. Ask your dialysis care team to teach you how to change dressings in an emergency. Now, I may just, look, this is just the graph and the fistula kit that we have called the HELP. The home emergency lifeline kit. This is just for grafts and fistula. Now we may create one for the catheter. This stuff is real. I don't just make this up to be um, coming up with a home emergency lifeline kit just to be selling it. You have warriors that you don't even know that I know as a professional that went home and they had the aneurysms, and didn't really know about them, stabbed being, still sticking them in the same spot, and then the area becomes real shiny, it's real shiny and weak. The next thing you know, you at home, just like it's any other night, you sleep and you roll over on your arm. You got the band-aids on them. You roll over. Next thing you know, you feel something warm coming down your arm and now your bed is soaking wet and the blood just gushing. What do you do? Especially if this never happened to you before and you like, oh my God, what do I do now? You you scrambling around. Now you're in bed, you hop up, you gotta run to the bathroom, because now you, you you're like real confused, like how do I stop the bleeding? You try to find something to put it on, blood just dripping all over the place. That's why we came up with these, to prevent that. If you're at home and you know you got aneurysms and it's a possibility, or if you ever started bleeding again at home or in your car, then you know what I'm talking about. If this is right near the bed stand and you're familiar with yourself with the help, you start bleeding, Excuse me. You start bleeding. Then you pull out a, a four by four, tear, rip it open. And you put it directly over the site. Uh, four, never remove, when you're at home, never remove the caps. You can, yeah, you can screw them off. Never remove the caps on the end of your dialyzer. Air, you, they don't want air to get in here. But check this out. I know, I know, if, 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 if you're not on kidney dialysis, it can definitely be too much to understand. You have to have this in to truly appreciate and understand this information that I'm talking about. Um, but true story, we used to have patients, I know patients who used to open these caps because they see us do it, changing it, putting the heparin in, closing the caps, opening up the, 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 the clamps. I knew people who put drugs, heroin, Inside the catheter. And I, I kid you not. 
I didn't see it, but you can tell, and you knew the patient, and you knew when you flushed them back, it was no blood in this in the limbs. And when they come back in, it's blood in the limbs, and the clamp is open, and it's dark. Like, come on. So don't take these off. Because people do take them off. Do not shower or swim. They say you may take a bath. You must not wet the catheter site or catheter dressing. Moisture, that's what they're concerned about. The moisture can cause infection. Moisture breeds bacteria. So taking a bath, they say it's safe. Now, with that being said, you do have warriors who went on Amazon and purchased a shower cover, a dressing cover to put over and took a shower. They just didn't let the water hit on it. And I know a lot of warriors who take showers with these catheters, but they protect it. And they don't let the water hit directly on that dressing area with the cover, with the extra cover. They get in the shower, shower, do what they got to do, you know, turn that back against the shower, right? Lather that self up. Then they turn to the side, right? Let the water come down sideways, hit right here, but they'll never let it hit directly on the um, on the dressing. The next one is wear a mask, right? Doesn't matter which type of mask you got, whether it's the one, the blue one that you see, the standard blue, or whether it's this. Uh, wear a mask over your nose because, as I mentioned, we all have what they say st staff right here in the bottom of the nasal flares. That's why when you go to the hospital and they put a, um, what you call it, a Q-tip swab, they swab your nose for MRSA. So wear a mask over your nose and mouth anytime the catheter, anytime this part is open to prevent bacteria from entering the catheter and into your bloodstream. Yes, we can't see bacteria with the naked eye. So when they open these caps up and they get ready to put the syringes on to pull the blood out, the mask down to the nose like this and they breathing I wonder if they sneeze Achoo! just automatically involuntarily and they got these open I knew a guy technician apparently he didn't have a mask on. Patient sneezed in his face. He caught some type of germ which attacked his kidney. And he, and he ended up with kidney failure. Such an ironic incident and unfortunate. Also, when they're opening these caps, make sure they're changing the gloves, washing their hands, especially when they put the syringes on to get access to the blood. These caps right here and clamps should be kept 
tightly closed when not being used for dialysis. Some places they wrap them up in a dressing. You may see it at the end. They may put tape right here so they don't be all a space apart moving around. So they may tape them. Then they put a dressing around it. Then they, you know, a patient may ask you, can you tape it down? Can you just tape it down over, you know, so it doesn't move. Okay, I'll do it. Only supposedly the dialysis team should uh, use your dialysis catheter to draw blood or get medication. If you go to the emergency room, say you somewhere, you got your catheter, you on a trip, and you got to go to an emergency room out of state. They don't know you from a can of paint. And they're trying to draw blood, right? And, and then they say, oh, you got a catheter. We can get it from there. It's like, no, 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 no. My care team told me I am not, I'm absolutely not supposed to let anyone or anyone else other than the dialysis care team to draw blood. In some places, as Doricia Stevenson, thank you, Doricia, for watching from YouTube. She's in Texas, and each state has different um uh policies or rules or laws or however you want to say it so in texas and like georgia only nurses can can handle these catheters only nurses that's not to say technicians can't do it because here in maryland and virginia and dc technicians can work with catheters but in certain states, only nurses can work with this. So thank you for bringing that up, Doricia. Now, when you look at this area, you take out the dressing, or uh, when you're at the clinic and they take out the dressing, you look around the area. If the catheter feels sore, or looks red, or you see some drainage coming out of that hole where it goes into, if it's red, sore, some drainage, and you got some chills, you know, they may, they may like come and go. It's a, it's a possibility. Possibility that you could have an infection. These are classic signs. Fever, redness around the catheter, soreness, tenderness, or drainage. Now, if you just got the catheter last week or three or four days ago, you can expect to have some tenderness or soreness. Now, this part I'm about to say is very important. Very important what I'm about to say, right, about this catheter. Now, you may have heard, if you're on dialysis, more than likely, you know about KT over V and URR. URR is urea reduction ratio. KT over V measures the adequacy of dialysis. Now, the KT over V and the URR are very important numbers because these numbers uh, tell you how much dialysis you are getting. And why is that important 
when I'm talking about the catheter. Because for one, the standard URR or what they wanted the least where they say you're getting a good treatment is 1.2. They want their you they want their KT over V to be at least 1.2 or higher. That means that, oh, you're getting enough treatment. That's, that's what they consider enough treatment, 1.2. And they say if they use the URR, that should be 65% or more. Now, if you go to dialysis and you got this catheter and they say your URR, say 0 0.95 or 0 0.8 and your URR may be 60. More than likely, it's this catheter. No, I'm talking about 1.2 for the number, the, for the KT over V number to be at the end of the month. Not 1.2 taken off, but be at least 1.2 for the KT over V number, which measures how much dialysis you are getting. That number, 1.2. Thank you, Camille. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here tonight. Yeah. So, um, but if your numbers are low and you got this catheter, more than likely, that's what's causing the low numbers because you got to remember this is a man-made device. This is not like your regular veins, right? And especially if this is not working right and they got to turn your blood flow rate down to get it to work. Or if you hear them say you got to go to access to get the catheter checked out. Or if your machine is always alarming and they coming to you and they like stopping the treatment and taking the caps off and disconnecting the lines and putting the syringe on and pulling and, and flushing and aspirating and flushing and then they connect you back up you know and, and it works a little bit then the machine goes off and you're trying to sleep that's what it is it's the catheter you may need to get, get it exchanged like I told you these small holes make a difference So, you need to know your, well, I ain't going to say you need to, but you should. You should know your numbers if you have a hemodialysis catheter. If you don't know anything else, you should know. And this is on your labs at the end of the month. The KT over V and the RR. Okay? Now, if your numbers are too low, the dietitian come back to you and say your numbers are low. One possible cause, just like I said, may be that your access is not working well. So if, it's, if, if that's the case, you're going to need to go to the access center. And I mean, if it keeps happening, you may have to look at other options, maybe going ahead and getting the access in your arm. Because, yeah, if you have a fistula, it is the best access because it's your own veins. The problem comes into play is when you go to the surgeon and they do the vein mapping. And if you don't know questions to ask, you may find yourself a victim of circumstances and he knows your veins are small down here, but you don't know. He said, okay, let's try down here. Then you try down there and you find yourself back and forth to the surgeon. And next thing you know, you go through all these procedures and then your hand gets messed up where it's aching, you got pain, you can't grip stuff. 
Then he finally said, okay, we're going to have to move up. Now you got to get a second surgery. You may even go home and go home and squeeze the ball after eight weeks. It should be looking good. And you're doing your best, squeezing the ball. And, and you still don't see nothing. So let's talk about concerns. Should you have any concerns about your catheter? Should you have any concerns about your catheter? Sometimes even when you are very careful, you can do all the right things. But your catheter can become clotted, or infected. And we know if you got warriors watching now that had a catheter and it's been infected, you know what I'm talking about. So let's talk about clots. And as I was saying all the time, the literature says it too. Clots can form inside the opening of the catheter or form on the outside of the catheter and block the opening. This can cause blood flow at a slower rate than the rate your doctor ordered. If the blood flow rate remains low for more than one dialysis treatment, the catheter should be checked and treated the same day. Early treatment may prevent the clot from totally blocking the catheter. It is important to restore the recommended blood flow rate and treat clots that are forming so that your catheter continues to work well and you get the amount of dialysis needed. So if this is not working because of clots, you're not going to get a good dialysis. That's what I'm trying to tell you guys. If you got one of these, it unfortunately for a lot of Warriors who may have like PAD, which is peripheral artery disease, or bad case of diabetes, your catheter may get clotted more than the average person. So we got one person that had it for six years. And you may be like, God darn, six years? I can't even keep mine for for three or four months. How is that? That's what I'm saying. Everybody's different. Everybody's different. But just know these can become clots or get clotted or have clots on the inside right here. Okay? Or in on the inside with these little holes at the bottom. So if they tell you, if you go to dialysis, you got one of these catheters, and they put the range on, and they try to pour blood out, and if there's nothing coming out, you know from Steve the Kidney Nurse show that there's something going on in these in the bottom with these holes. Because if these holes wasn't occluded, you would be able to aspirate blood out of these limbs. But if these holes are occluded or clogged up, it ain't nothing coming out. Look where it's sitting at. In the back of the heart muscle. So let's talk about infection. Infection can, can also occur even with a good blood flow rate. It is important to follow your catheter care instructions. That Again, this is so important because probably 90 to 95% of infections for the catheters are human error, meaning the caregiver not changing their gloves, washing their hands, following infection control, protocol so again 
Infection can also occur even with a good blood flow rate. It is important to follow your catheter care instructions exactly as you were taught in order to avoid infection. You should know the following signs and symptoms of a catheter infection and report them to your doctor or dialysis team right away so you can get the proper treatment as quickly as possible. Now, let me tell you what the signs and symptoms of a catheter infection are. You may not know. You may just got this and no one told you nothing. Signs and symptoms of a catheter infection include fever, chills, drainage from the catheter exit site, redness or tenderness around the catheter exit site, general feeling of weakness and illness. Again, the signs and symptoms of a catheter infection include fever, chills, drainage from the catheter exit site, redness or tenderness around the catheter exercise and general feeling of weakness and illness. So if you have one of these and you like feel like shit, I don't feel well, man. Feel malaise, tired. You may have a little chills or fever. And you're like, where is this coming from? Maybe coming from this, my friend. Coming from this. So treatment, treatment depends on the type of infection, but may include, we talk about the treatment for an infection of the catheter or from the catheter and ointment applied directly to the infected area if it's an exit site infection, meaning it's happening on the outside, to antibiotic medication, if there is drainage from the exit site, like vancomycin and genomycin, or an intravenous IV antibiotic, which is a solution containing an antibiotic that is administered directly into the vein. You may see this come around with the bag, a little bag of saline. Say, so, hey, we gotta give you some vancomycin. You gotta run over the last hour of treatment. You may see us come to the chair and hang the antibiotic. And that happens if the infection spreads to your blood. Now, let's talk about, and we are, we're almost done, but what happens when my catheter is not working well? We have a lot, a lot of warriors who catheters aren't working well. I see it every day. Every day that work. A decrease in the blood flow rate which is the blood pump on the machine, a decrease in the blood flow rate ordered by your doctor is a sign the catheter is not working as it should. If this occurs for more than one treatment in a week, the catheter should be checked. Again, a decrease in the blood flow rate ordered by your doctor is a... So if your blood flow rate is 400 and they got to turn it down to 350 to 300, a decrease in the blood flow rate ordered by your doctor is a sign that the catheter is not working as it should. If this occurs for more than one treatment in a week, the catheter should be checked. The lower blood flow rate will cause you to receive less dialysis. Less dialysis. A lower blood flow rate will cause you to receive less dialysis.
dialysis. Yes. Yes, it could, Dorisha. Dorisha had a question. Uh, she asked, fever, chills, redness, weakness, drainage could be signs of infection. Absolutely. See, they're going to have to, if you got drainage, they're going to have to culture that wherever that drainage comes from. I mean, my culture, they got this stick inside of a medium called a, a culture. And we get and we take it out. And wherever we see the drainage, we put it on the drainage like a cotton tip swab. And we get the, the, the drainage or a sample. And we put it back in the holder where the medium is, where that it grows to see if there's any presence of bacteria. Wound culture. So thank you for that. So the lower blood flow rate will cause you to receive less dialysis. You will then need a longer than usual hemodialysis treatment to get the proper amount of dialysis. So the lower blood flow rate will cause you to receive less dialysis. And then in return, you will need a longer than usual hemodialysis treatment to get the proper amount of dialysis because it's catheter. Also, another sign that your catheter is not working well may be the pre-pump arterial pressure alarm. Like, Steve, what is a pre-pump arterial pressure alarm? So the, the alarm notifies the, the dialysis tech or nurse that your catheter is not allowing a free draw of blood. This can be a sign that a clot is forming in the catheter blocking the flow of blood. So what does that mean? So... If you want, if you got one of these catheters, right, and you just got it, you had it for maybe three weeks, and now all of a sudden when they put you on, you start hearing the alarm constantly going off, the arterial alarm. And that's what I was telling you, they're trying to, they take it off and they're trying to flush the line. Hey, take a deep breath. Turn over on your side. Let me put you back. You Got to flush it. And they put you back on. But you don't know unless they tell you. They may have, instead of your blood flow rate being on 400, that's what I'm saying, know your orders. Know your treatment orders. Because what if you're supposed to be on 400 and they got the blood pump on 200, 250? You ain't getting no treatment. go to the access center so let's talk about um where is that medicine at Sorry, guys, let me put you on a quick brief hold.
Okay, I'm back. I'm back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was looking for the activates I had, but what can be done to remove the blockage from these cath? Uh, thank you guys for uh, for the commercial watching it again. Get checked for kidney disease. Now look, what can be done to remove the blockage from these catheters? What can be done? And like I said, I was looking for uh, the medication that uh, that I have here that's used. It's called TPA. All right. So the treatment uh, is the administration what they call a clot busting medication called tissue plasma plasminogen activator or TPA tissue plasminogen activator or TPA now most dialysis centers can give the medication while you are sitting right there in the dialysis chair thus preventing a hospital visit now if you are at the end of your treatment uh, TPA can be given just before your next dialysis appointment, but some places don't like to do this. Uh, now, ask your doctor how you can arrange to be given this medicine if you had this catheter and you're having these issues with blockage. All right. If the clot is not treated when signs and symptoms of an early clot are found, the catheter can progress to fully clot it. Now, if it goes to fully clotted, you're going to need to get this whole thing replaced. Now, how is the TPA given, the medicine? Uh, and basically, what it is, we open up the, the catheter, we put the, med we put the fluid, some sterile water, and the uh, medication, which is a powdered form, we put it in there, stir it up, then we withdraw, and then we put it inside the catheter, and we let it, what we call the well, or sit inside for up to like 30 minutes to 45 minutes. And what this, this medicine is designed to do is break down the clot. It's a clot buster, dissolves the clot from around these holes. Now, they're not going to tell you this. Because the average unit doesn't have one of these. They say, hey, Mr. Scott, this is what's going on. But you may want to know why you keep going back to the access center. And this is one of the reasons why, my friend. Right here, these holes. So what are, what are the benefits of treating the clot early? By restoring your blood flow, hemodialysis can work as it should to remove the toxins and excess fluid from your body. Taking care of the clot early results in fewer treatment interruptions and improved life on dialysis. Also, other benefits are the prevention of additional health problems and the chance to live longer on dialysis. What can you do to keep your catheter working well? One, learn as much as possible about your prescribed treatment plan. I've always said that. Your blood flow rate, how often and how long you need treatments. Follow the treatment plan. Stay for your full treatment time. Uh, keep your dialysis appointments. Arrive on time for your dialysis treatment. Because I told you, if you arrive late, they're going to cut your time. They're going to cut your time if you arrive late. Yeah, saline flushes, we be trying that as well to restore the flow. Hey, Letitia, thank you for joining. So also ask the doctor if you ever get to see him or the nurse practitioner, how much dialysis should you be getting? Always talk about keep a record, get one of those notebooks that you get from CVS or the drugstore those black and white spiral notebooks. Keep a record of your KT over V and your URR numbers, as well as your dry weight, how much weight you gain, your blood pressure, your pulse. 
Also, talk to the dialysis tech or nurses if your numbers don't look good. The dietitian, find out what's going on. Also, share your concerns with your nephrologist or kidney doctors and the team. Don't be shy to let them know what your thoughts are about this. You may want to ask them some questions like, how can I tell if my catheter is not working? What is the flow rate the doctor ordered for me? What is the, uh, why does the flow rate for your catheter need to be at this level? So like I'm saying, if you know you run at 400 blood flow rate and you just happen to look over at the blood flow rate and you see it at 300, you're not getting the proper treatment. You want to know why they turned that blood flow rate down. Don't be oblivious to it. Also, you want to ask, like, if my flow rate should go now, when will I be given clot dissolving medicine? So we can open this up and have it running at full restoration or full patency. Also, you may want to ask, will the clot dissolving medication interrupt my dialysis treatment? And it will. And if so, what will happen to the rest of my treatment? Some patients, they got to get this put in and they don't even pause the treatment. The machine's still running for 30, 40 minutes like you're on having the treatment and you sitting there getting these, this medicine in and they done returned your blood and put the lines and recirculating but they didn't put it on pause. They still got it running like you getting the treatment. And so now when they go hook it up, it's going to start from right there like you didn't already been on. And that's not the case. It happens a lot. And now you cheated out of your time and you don't even know it. Also, you may want to ask, how will you put the clot dissolving medicine in the catheter? And I showed you three cc syringe, they connect it to here and they inject it in and then put the cap back or they leave the syringe on and it's just sitting there. Last but not least, Last but not least, what are ask them what are the signs and symptoms of an infection? <laughs> Say call OSHA. What are the signs and symptoms of an infection? All right. Now with that being said, I went over my time, I went 21 minutes. Uh, about to close down, but I'd like to thank everyone from on Facebook and YouTube who joined the show to learn about hemodialysis catheters, how to keep yours working well. And if you came in in the middle of this, you can go back and watch the replay. Okay, but I, I believe I gave some good tips and pointers of how to keep your access working well. Um, and with that being said, again, thank you guys for watching. God bless you and have a great uh, day tomorrow, Sunday. Okay, and we got Valentine's Day coming up as well. So hopefully we may be back going again tomorrow evening. Uh, if not, look for us Tuesday afternoon. Let me see, I have a comment pop up. Oh, thank you, Leticia. Salute to you too. Appreciate you watching and your support as always. Take care, God bless, and stay blessed and encouraged. Peace.
ground, don't get caught in the mosh pit The fuel to the fire, ain't nobody can stop it the Trouble in my city, but you know I'm across it Got a 40 on my hip and I'm liable to spark it Throw down these hits, my click is indivisible I aim, you duck, I squeeze, now you invisible I'm not afraid of getting physical All these different chemicals are fogging up my visuals Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Yo, we notorious, we ain't no runners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Yo, we some warriors, they ain't called gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Put on my sweat, put on the beat, put on the map, put on my team Take out every motherfucker in between, know what I mean? Better myself, better my aim, better my rap, better my name Killing rappers on my hang, I'm about to chase for the fame Never thought I would, and now I'm running You don't wanna 